So today, we will be discussing what it means to be a news organization for the social web. You'll walk away with insight into why original reporting and scoops are shareable, how BuzzFeed approaches breaking news, and what the vision of the newsroom strategy is of tomorrow. BuzzFeed's news section um, is driven by social sources. 75% of our overall traffic comes from social sources and an even higher percentage of that to news content. And people are consuming news much differently than five today than five years ago or even one year ago. You know, with the advent of social media and our newsroom of over 150 reporters and editors, you know, people are discovering content and consuming it and sharing it via BuzzFeed as a trusted source of journalism. So with us today, we have Jonah Peretti, BuzzFeed CEO and founder. He studied at MIT Media Lab and he co-founded the Huffington Post. From the start, Jonah has been obsessed with the idea of how information spreads, why people share, whether it's on Facebook, on Twitter, on Pinterest. So what types of content engage the human psyche and why is sharing such a powerful tool? These are the questions that we'll look to address today. And joining Jonah is Ben Smith, BuzzFeed's editor-in-chief. And prior to BuzzFeed, Ben was a journalist and reporter for Politico. Ben leads BuzzFeed's editorial team of over 150 reporters and journalists who cover everything from politics to business to culture. We're with reporters in the Middle East, in Africa, now in Russia, and launching an investigative unit as well. Ben's team's focus is to deliver comprehensive news and entertainment coverage from serious journalism, like the Boston bombings, and the lighthearted content, like 13 things to get you through a rough day. Always a crowd pleaser. <laughs> so, Jonah and Ben, the floor is yours. Thank you. You are welcome. Should we sit over here? Yeah. Am I interviewing Ben or is Ben interviewing me? <laughs> <laughs> Whichever way you'd like it, right? Conversation. I think you're interviewing me. <laughs> no, you're interviewing me. <laughs> what kind of a question is that? <laughs> That's how interviews should all start. So people get in arguments about who, who's interviewing and who's uh, So you find out who has more power? Is that what it is? Who has more power, the interviewer or the interviewee? The interviewer. That's the thing people don't always get. So that brings us to <laughs> being a reporter, where you're asking lots of people questions. Yeah. Um, how is, um, you know, do, I, I don't know if you, if you had ever experience in your youth as be, being a print reporter. But yeah. How, how, is, how has things changed since then? Like, what, what are the biggest sort of differences? Um, I mean, I think that if you're a beat reporter, which is what I always was, you always had a sense that there was kind of a centralized conversation that you were trying to beat the competition. You know, when I was, I started at the New York Sun, this little New York City broadsheet, and you know, there were, that was there were like five really competitive New York City newspapers, and you know, I remember once I got a scoop, and like the woman from the New York Post like met me on the steps of City Hall and like shook my hand to congratulate me that I'd gotten the big scoop. Like you noticed each she other. She won it. Yeah, exactly, and like he was very intensely competitive, and you noticed each other, but that competition wasn't really transparent to readers, and in fact, papers would often, like if the, the New York Post and the Daily News, I think to this day, will never acknowledge that the other has gotten a scoop. They'll just pretend the other one hasn't, because they want their readers to think that they had it first. They don't want to say, this was in the New York Post first, and for fear that somebody the next day goes and buys that paper. Right, or like the Daily Mail, which which their model is to read other stuff and then right. re and re rewrite. I mean, and rewrite, get me yeah. a rewrite. This is like a, you know, that kind of aggregation has been a major, you know, that's sort of what the AP is sort of founded on. I mean, that's a big feature of traditional media. But now that I think a lot of that competition, a lot of the collaboration, a lot of the sort of new, the conversation among and between beat reporters is now all public on Twitter. And it kind of shifted over time. There were blogs where these conversations were happening in a somewhat more transparent way and now you know, you see the reporters and their sources basically talking to each other in public, and a lot of that conversation, a lot of which is too boring for your average reader, but for a reader who's very interested in, in the mechanics of this and how it works, is all kind of exposed now. Yeah, so that has created a lot of interesting challenges, and I feel like there's a lot of misunderstandings about what does it mean for the public to see all this information that used to be hidden inside newsrooms. Um, <clears throat> with the, with the um, Sandy Hook shootings, there was a law enforcement official who told, um, I think, a CNN reporter incorrect information, and then many other publications, you know, said, oh, this is a good source because it came through CNN, 
um, and, and then later it turned out the information was false. Um, we saw with the Boston Marathon um, bombings that there was um, a lot of the best information was on Instagram and on Twitter, but also lots of, and Reddit, and, but there was also lots of bad information on those sources. How, how have you built the newsroom at BuzzFeed to deal with that kind of complexity? Yeah, I do think that's, these big breaking news stories are this really central challenge now, and I think maybe the biggest way that news reporting has changed, just in that it was always a total disaster inside newsrooms when news breaks, like you'd be sending reporters out to the wrong guys, housed and calling the wrong people and having like horrible interactions with innocent people. And you know, I mean, there's a, a guy who works for CNN um, on 9-11, you know, the, the, the towers had fallen and, and he, or at least the planes had hit the towers and he happened to be downtown as a business reporter and was like taking shelter in a doorway and heard a huge bang and, said, and was on air and said, I just heard another explosion. Stepped outside, realized it was just a passing truck, but by then his phone connection had cut. And um, to this day, it's like a part of the 9-11 conspiracy literature that there was a third explosion, CNN reported it and then covered it up. And so there's always been this How chaos of the early moments of breaking news. It's just now that that chaos is happening in public for everybody to see and people are like oh my god news is like these news organizations are terrible and they're so broken and they're so and like they're so confused and these by the way these law enforcement sources on whom they're relying are totally confused i mean the classic thing that happens is that you know i call a, a, a you know a police source and say hey have you heard this and the guy says no and then somebody from you know another newspaper calls that source and says hey have you heard this and they just heard it from me so the police source says oh yeah i'm hearing that too and then they go and report that a law enforcement source is hearing, you know, this chatter or whatever. So I mean, for like, for us as a news organization, I think what that for every news organization, there's this choice. You have this, you can assume that your audience isn't seeing all this stuff or isn't taking seriously all the things on Twitter and Reddit and Facebook and in their email, and that, and that you should sort of t play the traditional role of only print things that you have confirmed yourself that are absolutely clear. Ignore all the bad information or in the, and all the questionable information. Or you can assume, as we do. That your reader is like swimming in this ocean of data of information is totally overwhelmed by it, and your role in those very very noisy situations is to try as transparently as possible to say what you know. To also it's very very useful to say what you don't know, and then when you're not sure about something, but that everybody's heard it, to say you know here's something that people are saying. Here is exactly where it comes from. We're not sure if it's true. We put in a call to so and so, but just to be very transparent. Well, I mean, I remember we had posts on during the Boston bombings of here's what we know so far, yeah. you know, and included things like Patriot's Day. Some people are saying that this is related to Patriot's Day and Timothy, was it Timothy McVeigh? The, the, yeah. The Oklahoma bombing? It, uh, did, you know, did bomb, did this terrorist act on Patriot's Day, but actually it was three days off of Patriot's Day, and so, so it probably doesn't seem very likely that... Yeah, it, it is or it isn't, but that's... But, but that's, what, that's, that's sort of the, the different side here's of why people are saying... Here's what you can know things. about what is being said right now. And meanwhile, you're you know reporting like crazy and trying to confirm what is actually going on. So we we were the first news site to authenticate Buzzfeed Number Two's Twitter account. How did yeah. we how did we figure that out? Um, I mean, that was something where it is really useful of reporters who both have you know totally traditional reporting chops and who are you know just understand like how do you tell if this is somebody's real Twitter account? Well, you look back and see if the photographs from bef that are dated to before when he got famous, you know whether they exist, whether he's in them. So he wasn't in the news. And, and so that was and, one thing. And then the and other thing was we called his high school friends and said, hey, is this Twitter his Twitter account? Because obviously they'd know. And, what, and, and, and so um, essentially having an understanding of the web and how Twitter works yeah. and having real reporters together yeah. allowed us to do, break and that story. the same story. is true with YouTube. Like, you know, the, I mean, there was a lot of, in that first day on the Boston bombing, actually, they had posted a bunch of YouTube videos of themselves, the, the brothers. Um, but YouTube, like, if you don't use YouTube a lot, it's easy to get confused between what the video somebody posted and what the video somebody commented on. Mm -hmm. You know, just the way it threads. Mm -hmm. And if you go to somebody's profile page, you see their comments and you click the video, but it's a video of somebody else. So, that, and, and, and so we had, you know, both reporters who, have, you know, like, grew up on YouTube and get which is videos which, but also we had reporters who spoke Russian and then got the jokes that they were making about, you know, a Dagestani, uh, a, uh, what was it, like a Dagestani in Ingushet and a Chechen or in a car and they see a police I mean they sort of like and that there was like a kind of anti-Russian kind of nationalistic jokes that these guys were telling so you kind of have to have both so I think we had a piece about how 2014 will be the year of the hoax or the viral hoax yeah um, how are we how, how, how what role do we play in uh, in that space 
And I'm like resisting all the jokes. All the jokes, yeah. Um, I resisted a joke earlier. Well done. When you, That's your, unusual. Your nine your nine eleven story. I was like, how did they get you to tell this story now about your your CNN friend? But you know, <laughs> I'm not a nine eleven conspiracy conspiracy theorist, so I figured I wouldn't tell the joke because it would confuse people. Um, <laughs> uh, so hoaxes. hoaxes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think people are really hungry for. I mean, it, hoaxes have always been a big part of journalism often played by journalists like the, new, the old New York Sun was famous I think the 1840s that for weeks had New Yorkers believing that people that life had been discovered on the moon these giant kind of bat like man like creatures yeah the moon hoax and it's just like they're a huge circulation jump that you know helped and propel they, them for decades into the lead and so and they believed that they were no no it was, it was, it was a deliberate hoax totally the, media, the media used to participate in like in deliberate hoaxes to sell papers and I think you know in some cases in some countries still does um and, you know, bad information has, you know, always been a huge challenge because, like, there's a kind of story, like, there are stories that are too good to be true. And, you know, and, and you kind of want to tell those stories. And so I think, and on the web, you know, those stories, like every other story, can spread in a way that's well, every time bigger and faster. Every time there's a, a major storm, you see pictures of weather. Yes, for instance. That are actually, that are either some other storm entirely or they're Photoshop or, you know, like you see, oh, this is a tsunami that's about to hit Staten Island and it's yeah. actually a Photoshop wave and or tsunamis don't actually look like that or, yeah, it's Planet yeah. of the Apes or, or it's... Um, no, I mean, so, you know, our reporters are obsessed with trying to debunk stuff. Um, but if you, if, you, if you don't go on the web and you just subscribe to the New York Times and you get it in the paper in the morning... You never see that that fake tsunami. No, and, or planet and it being. would be crazy for them to write a story saying, "Hey, here's this false thing that you've never heard of that we're going to kind of put in your head, but it's false. Don't worry. Like that's a terrible. That is a terrible idea. But for our audience, it's in. It will be in their head because they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook. No, and they're... it'll be in their head with some doubt. I mean, I think people. Yeah. I think readers are very sophisticated, and people who live on Twitter and Facebook are very sophisticated that not all this stuff is true. But like, but also that they're not experts and they're not sure which is which. And our reporters, both of them, like living in these spaces and know how to figure out. Whether you know which is which, and also are comfortable picking up the phone and calling people and trying to check stuff out, and so we do that. You know, that's that's, and I think, I mean, we debunked. There was a famous picture of the, was it, of, of the the Sphinx covered in snow, and there's some big storm the other day, except it was a Sphinx from um, from a theme park in Japan. Right. That one was going around, and Michael Rush was I think the first to debunk it. Right, like right now, any freezing cold we weather. Yeah image will spread virally totally and i think like one of the things that we think about is like how do you like drive a stake through that thing like like if you tweet this picture is fake and you just tweet the picture immediately someone will grab it and retweet it and it'll get garbled and it'll spread <laughs> and so you know you want to like photoshop onto the picture fake in a way that stays with the jpeg and doesn't rely on your story right 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 and we actually just added a tool to the to our cms where you can do that yep so when you joined buzzfeed there was a lot of of speculation in the media world where, and surprise you know why would someone who is a respected journalist join a site which at the time was was focused mostly on web culture and entertainment and cute kittens uh, you know cute kittens as a shorthand for internet culture yeah um and and i think some people thought that you were going to take buzzfeed where from where it was and just move away from all the internet culture stuff and turn it into you know a a a organization that just puts out journalistic work and and you haven't done that in fact the the team there was a funny parody video that yes, we were so watching great. last night of you a, a fake Ben <laughs> Smith approving all these lists Younger, you know fake ben Smith. Um, <laughs> and um, and so the lists and the quizzes and and all this entertaining content continues to be a big part of BuzzFeed under your leadership um, you know why why did you know why did you uh continue to grow well, that stuff i'm mostly just trying to please the boss <laughs> <laughs> i know that's what he likes best no. um uh, i mean i think you know i mean i do think that you know like it's both his great strength that we like grew organically out of web culture and these sort of language and conversation of, of the web and aren't taking print forms and moving them online or, or try or at least not you know that we're not focused on that we don't see that as kind of our mission but trying to like speak a an authentic online language i mean i guess the other way to ask the question is why don't other people embrace the web more like yeah. what yeah like why why I, mean, I do think it's like we grew up on the web like you and i and most of the people here grew up in a very like actually grew up on the web you know what i mean and and these forms like the notion like the i like and, and find it slightly puzzling that people are puzzled that people send pictures of cute animals to each other and post them on their facebook pages like that's not a actually new phenomenon in america but i've noticed when when publications even online publications 
start posting cute kittens for the first time or post a, a quiz or a list for the first time, they get a backlash. Like, how can you do this? It's it's destroying your brand. And, and I think people confuse like the forms of media and of journalism for the values. And I think you know, and a lot of the forms of news reporting. I mean, the Wire story being kind of the first. I mean, actually. To be fair, the, the AP knows this better than anybody and is desperately trying to get away from the kind of traditional wire story. But if you want to see something nobody reads or shares, it's the wire story. I mean, it's just like, and it's a form that was designed like very much. So you could cut from the bottom in a print newspaper. I mean, there were all these, it was a very useful form for a totally different medium. But then reporters, you know, learn that the way you write a story is you have like, you pack all this information in the first sentence, you have a second sentence that summarizes the story, you have a third paragraph that just like tells you all sorts of random stuff, most of which you already knew. You then have a quote that is often quite snappy from maybe you ever heard of that like maybe just repeats the previous sentence. It's a very wooden form. And the wire story became a big part of online publishing in that online publishers could just license AP stories yeah, it's cheaper. and then fill in all the gaps in, in their coverage. And so you'd see a lot of online publications um, feature lots of wire stories. But what you're saying is that the wire story was created in print to for these allow very for, for these reasons. very specific reasons. And I think one of our like big projects is sort of to reinvent the wire story. And, you know, what does that look like? Where you can pull all the media, you know, you, where where you can where you can pull all the media that you're talking about into the thing. You know, you don't have to say that they said something. You can also, if the video, you can have a GIF. You can if 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 a piece of media is in the story, you don't have to quote from a tweet. You can pull in the tweet, um, and 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 just in sort of what what would, will people see? Like, how will news travel? In this new medium, I think it's much more visual. Um, it's and it's sometimes it's funny. It's more emotional. Yeah. The other thing that you mentioned that being easy to cut from the bottom, which it's almost the opposite on the web, where you can scroll forever. Yeah. So how does that change the way your team uh, develops, you know, content or? or I mean, or I think stuff stories? on the web is. I mean, it's funny because I do think there's this kind of long form revival, which is great, and that a lot of, and there's sort of a sense that. You know, long narrative stories are things people on the internet want to read, which is true and is great. Um, I mean, I think the challenge is that if you're an editor at a magazine, it's and I talked to Steve Kendall, our um, our uh, feature editor, and to again, and Mark Lotto, who's at Medium now, doing this. And Mark was saying that it's like, you know, it was so easy to tell a writer, you know, I love this beautifully written five paragraph riff in the middle about your mother, but you know, unfortunately, we've only got two columns, and so we're just have to cut it. Yeah. And it's harder to tell the writer, you know, this is, like, really depressive and boring, um, even though right. it's very treasured to you, so we're going to cut it. And so I think... This is great for your personal blog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you have the long version. Yeah. But so, and editing is a real craft, and cutting is really, really important. Like, things should be as short as they can possibly be. And then, and, it's a, and there's this, now there's this sort of idea, I think, that people will read things because they're long, and like this hashtag long form. People will read things in spite of their being long, if they're wonderful, and if they're so compelling that you like have to move from paragraph to paragraph, and that's like a real editing challenge. And the crutch for editing has always been you have a space limit, and that's like a great formal tool to force you to compress, and it's a different thing where... It's almost like Twitter has 140 characters, yeah. which, which, haiku, which right? created, a, or haiku, or yeah. Yeah, the constraints help help. Yeah, and so you're like, it's actually really hard to edit without space limits, or you have to think, but also, ultimately, I think, you know, superior. Right. Because ultimately, the story can take however long it takes. Right, and you're not writing the story in a structure that allows you to cut from the bottom, any because you can you can cut from any point, yeah. and it, it doesn't really, yeah, matter. Um, yeah, so, um, I know some people watching this are, um, are work in advertising or on the branded side, and you don't, t you know, work, you, you don't, uh, um, your, your team doesn't have anything to do with that part of BuzzFeed's business. Um, but there are increasingly brands who are saying, I want to learn from news organizations on you know, how to, how to um, you know, be better at telling stories, how to be faster, how to go from having weeks of approvals um, to get a television commercial on to reacting in real time. And you saw during the Grammys and during this, the Super Bowl, we're going to see a lot of it. Um, you know, brands are like on Twitter and they're interacting. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things I've noticed um, is that when you look at actual news organizations, um, there's lots of slow news days. Like the the opportunity yeah. to do real time stuff is so rare. Like when you look at yeah, that when, breaking news moment is, is the exception. Yeah, and and so there's some brands who've gotten so enthusiastic for real time marketing that they're like, I'm going to just do the bro breaking news moment at every single second. And then what you've seen is that they start 
treating a non-breaking news moment like a breaking news moment and like doing all this real-time stuff and people are like whoa like you're really excited about this minor thing that's <laughs> happening um and so i i think that you know just as a just general generally not with um not um in, in terms of, of brand marketing but just in general like how do you see uh the the difference between a slow news day and what kind of content you create and um, or what kind of entertainment in some cases at, at, you know BuzzFeed do you focus on and then when there's breaking news and what are the sort of different um, skill sets when you, you know for those different mm. kind of moments and I think it's it's interesting I mean in the, in the way I think about news on those two things it's almost inverse in that on a big breaking news story you're trying to like try, you're trying to um, to steer people through this very very noisy information environment and to bring things bring it together in a coherent way whereas in a on a slow news day you're trying to create sort of a singular fragment of a like an advance something new about a story that will still travel off on its own mm -hmm. um, yeah I do think I mean I don't you know I don't well, so think a, I don't, a slow I news day is more you're setting the agenda yeah you're trying to drive or, the story and driving the story and people yeah. talk about the thing that you you put out there right and on a on a Breaking news day. Everyone's fixing on the story, the and you're trying story. to help them understand it and, yes, and totally. engage with and it. Put it in context. The um, right, and, and I mean, I do think you know, I don't, I haven't like obviously spent a whole lot of time thinking about branded stuff, but like the brand that I spent a lot of time thinking about in '08 was Obama. Right. As a political reporter, these these political organizations are basically media companies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they put out content, they put out speeches, they put out videos, and what I, you know, what you started to notice particularly with the Obama campaign, was that they were very competitive with media organizations for people's time. I mean, right. as, you know, as good advertising always is. Like, it's, it's, and I think in the, you know, as, the, as there's a shift from ads that ride along next year content to ads that are themselves content, I mean, it's, you know, you're competing with your advertisers. I see stuff from our, I won't like <laughs> mention the post, but there was a post that was similar to an editorial post, only kind of better executed, right. like purely coincidentally. But um, well, and there should be, you, there you, should be certain things that brands are better at doing. Like I, I, I look at the access that some brands have. Right. You know, if you sponsor the Grammys or you know the right. Super Bowl, you you might be able to get access to things that right. And I guess you, if you're a brand, you don't worry about compromising your values or asking tough enough questions. I mean, you're doing a totally different thing. So. It's a different thing, but you and in some cases, the brands right. have more resources. And then there are these you know things like Red Bull, where it's not you know it's, it gets very blurred. And I mean, it's it's interesting though because you definitely find yourself competing if you're reporting away against your sources, right? I mean, the Obama campaign was putting. Out, I mean, we were sort of struck. I mean, all these news organizations were putting out these really terrible videos in like 2007, 2008 videos of like me talking at a camera, like terrible video except this one is up there. <laughs> yeah, great but um well that's the sign here but uh, and obama was putting out these beautifully produced and cut kind of propaganda reels and they were just like you, could, right. you know you, you just you're these things in some way are competing for the same person's attention at the same time it's just obvious which one is going to win right well and we have the super bowl coming up this weekend and it's that is really the classic moment right. where there are a lot of people who watch the super bowl for the ad yeah. and the ad they spend a lot of time and energy thinking about how do they capture people's right. attention um, so it, it, it is a pretty it is a pretty interesting time where all and also a situation with the advertisers have access to content, which is to say elements of the football game that almost every media company is barred by the NFL from using. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, there's a there's a huge there's a huge yeah. aspect. Well, I mean, you see even with with sort of access journalism, where you know celebrity magazines will trade trade certain types of coverage for access to the celebrity. Right. You know, so there's there's a whole uh, there's a whole continuum I think of 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 access that. That can result in a certain type of coverage, but then prohibits you from doing. Yeah, no, other, I mean the, the sort of the, the, I, the sort of slogan on this all I was like was that access is a curse, and I think right. we're probably on the pretty far end of not caring that much about access. Right. Yeah. I mean, we've seen the web uh, on the web in particular that people who are sort of you know outside of the normal circles of access end up being able to do really incredible work. So we have we have a little time for uh, for some questions. I think. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you guys so much for a great conversation. We do have a lot of questions from the audience, so let's get started. When there's a breaking news event, what are the steps that BuzzFeed takes to start building a story? I mean, I think it's just a matter of starting with what you know, which often is firsthand images from the scene, you know, mm -hmm. that you do try to tweet tweets or Instagrams or comments from law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And you know, none of these things are perfect. So many, I mean, law enforcement in particular is often as lost as you are mm -hmm. in the first few minutes. And you just try to, you try to kind of na very narrowly say what you know and say how much you know about each fact and then constantly update that. Okay. 
that's that's a good segue into the next question. How are visuals chosen? Whether it's GIFs or still images. I mean, I think you want. I mean, I think you know one of the things that's really core to sharing is um, you know is that things are really emotionally compelling and gripping, and that's a big part of, of images. I mean, I think one thing again, the big breaking news events, which are sometimes kind of tragic. There's always newsroom debates over whether images are too graphic. Um, yeah. And really hard, these are like genuinely hard questions and we have big disagreements internally as I'm sure most news organizations do. And like well, I tend to be on the, you know, people have a choice to look at things side and, and other people here feel like you don't want to just run across some horrific image in the middle of the day that you weren't looking. And I think, you know, that's a totally legit debate. And Well, and we, also we've had some, some technological approaches to yeah. it where we give the user more control where something's covered and it warns them that you know, this is a graphic image, and you know you can see it if you feel mm -hmm. like you need to. But most yeah, people, that, most people don't. And that is something where on the web, actually, unlike in print, you can you can have it both ways because we, you can have a you know, we have this image overlay that grays out images, and if people want to see them, they can. Because it, it's kind of ridiculous on the web to assume that you can shield people from anything. Right. Right. I mean, you could find the most horrific things on the web that you can imagine. Like you could sit down and just Im imagine the most horrific thing that and then somewhere it. on the web you could find that. Mm -hmm. And so the idea of a print publication saying we're not going to show the injuries that as a result of someone stepping on a landmine or something terrible. Mm -hmm. Um, on the on the web, people will be able to find that if they want to see that, and they feel like they need to know, you know, well, I want to see what actually happened. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people don't want to, and so a lot of it it shifts from 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 the control being the media organization to the control being the the, the reader. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let's um, move on to the next question. So, how does mobile play into the consumption of journalism? I mean, it's just you know, I think you know when I think of somebody reading. And this isn't a breaking news story or a political or tech story. You know, the mm -hmm. sort of core image you have of your reader is somebody who is on their mm -hmm. phone and opens their Twitter app mm -hmm. for for a breaking story, for for a feature, maybe opens their Facebook app, and it's and it, they're looking at it on their phone. So you know, we think a lot about making sure that I mean, not making sure that it also looks good on the phone. Just making, just assuming that the phone is where somebody's going to see it when we write our stories. In, in the preview window, you see how it looks on the phone. Yeah, so you can't publish without seeing a mobile preview. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about um, it? You know, consumers are going to read long form, which is something that you discussed. You know, that we're with Steve Candell, who's writing long form as a featured writer. How do we see long form performing on mobile? Really well. That actually, like, I mean, I actually really. I mean, it's. I think that's. I think. When things go, go very, very viral, they tend to be more mobile just because people do a lot of their sharing on their phones. And mm -hmm. they, but, um, but the, I kind of, and so, but we certainly see, I think it was like, we had a very widely read story about a six thousand word piece about a guy who, um, you know, renovated a house in Detroit. Um, and I think more, like more than 60% of the readers were on mobile. And I mean, I actually really like the, I mean, I think, you know, people have different ideas of, you know, People, it's hard to tell what's you know what is like a good experience and what's just what you're used to. Mm -hmm. But I really like the experience of reading a very long thing, just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and not turning pages and not looking for the continued on page eighty seven. And I mean, I think that's actually a really good experience. Okay, uh, let's get to one more question. We didn't really talk about um, the international expansion. Can you expand on that <laughs> about yeah. what your plans are for international expansion? Um, and how do you choose which countries to cover? Um, well, I think there, there are two different things we're doing internationally. One is a, one is that we have reporters around the world covering writing in English for a kind of international audience, people who care about Syria, who care about what's happening in Ukraine right now. And then a second and totally for now separate thing is that we have um, teams in, Lon in London, in um, Sydney, mm -hmm. and I think in Sao Paulo pretty soon, and in other countries. Um, writing BuzzFeed content for people in those, in Brazil, in, in England, in, um, in uh, Australia, and, and, and then also in, in French and Spanish for, the, for audiences in those languages. And so, I mean, I think that's, a very, that's like a very exciting thing, and I think, you know, some of the things we do are kind of universal, and some of web culture is kind of universal, and then a lot is very specific, and specific to identities and languages and cultures and media cultures, and so, I don't know, I think we see a big opportunity to do that. Yeah, and I think there, that there's a way to, to internationalize that didn't exist before mm -hmm. because Facebook and Twitter are already so global. 
and that's a big part of BuzzFeed's distribution is people sharing our content on social platforms. It means we can move to other countries, we can expand to other countries, and first of all, they all, we already have readers in other countries before mm -hmm. we even get, go there. Um, some of them are read, you know, reading in English, or you know, or um, or even if they don't speak great English, they're re they're looking at more visual posts and, mm -hmm. and web culture stuff that they can kind of get a sense of what it's about. Um, and so we're able to begin by translating our content, then mm -hmm. um, put an exploratory team in to, to, to start to create content for the, that local market, um, and then then um, accelerate to to hire a bigger editorial team and then and then monetize with the business team coming in com coming once we realize that there's a real opportunity there and so we've gone through that whole process already in the UK and mm -hmm. um, now the UK is uh, is is uh, you know will be over 10 million unique visitors just in the UK which is um, a lot for a market that's you know a fifth the size of the US mm -hmm. um, and then um, we are and we already are closing um, you know and Closing revenue and partnering, finding finding great partners um, in the UK for on, on the on the business side, um, and so that's the, the general process. So we're going to repeat in other other markets. Exciting, I love it. All right, one more question that we just got in hot off the press. What is the new big thing you focused on to elevate your social web presence? Huh? To elevate our social web presence. I'm not. You mean the site or individually? Or is that just the question? For the site. For the site. For the site, sure. Yeah. I mean, I you know, there's there's lots of things, and there's not one silver bullet, but I think we tend to think from the perspective of people, and and when we look at what we're doing, we say, would a person want to share that? And they might want to share a news scoop because it's new information, and people naturally want to share, uh, you know, n new things about the world and new knowledge about the world. Did you hear that this just happened or that just happened? It might be entertaining content um, mm -hmm. and that, that it touches quiz. people emotionally. It might be a quiz. It might be something <laughs> that you know you, you aren't interested in, but you know your friend will be interested in because your friend has a certain identity or background or interest and so you share it with them. And so um, avoiding the, the kind of abstraction that you sometimes see people in business do, which is that they look at something and they say, oh, let's look at the numbers and let's, like, mm -hmm. let's do more of this and less of that, blah, 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 which is like fine to a point, but if you stop if you don't, if you lose sight of the fact that these are actual people, <laughs> readers who are smart and engaged and whose lives w we want to enrich, mm -hmm. um, you you lose something important and you start seeing weird things where you see a web page and you're like, whoa, there's a lot of weird things on this web page and the content doesn't even make sense to a human. Like, why is you know, oh, it must be some SEO thing they figured out mm -hmm. or it must be some kind of a trick or or a headline where you read it and you're like. This headline is saying that this is the most amazing thing ever, but it's not telling me what it is. And mm -hmm. so, like, like I, I guess I have to like click it to find out. But it's like total, like, like it feels mm -hmm. like it was written by some weird algorithm that mm -hmm. that wasn't human. Because why would a human write something like this? When you see stuff like that, we, you know, we we just generally think that's going to be a short-lived those kinds of approaches, and that if you focus on on an underlying sort of human need of what role does this media play in people's lives? Does this make someone smarter? Does this make someone more well informed? Does this make someone laugh? Does it make someone feel an emotion? And if you hit all of those, you know, if you hit those kinds of, of human needs, um, you're going to be able to continue to invest in, and build more and more on top of that. Right. Great. And that's across the board, editorial, advertising alike. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's great. For sure. Yeah. I mean, you see on the ad side too, where, where some, some you know companies will make will make for whether it's branded content or just a television ad or whatever mm -hmm. where it's clearly the marketing brief is driving the creative not right. something that any human would ever care <laughs> about you know so it's sort right. of like it's like you almost imagine executives meeting and having a conversation we want to position ourselves to be for young people so like make an ad and then the ad is like millennials yeah the ad is like millennials love our product and you're kind of like <laughs> you're kind of like um like like are you you're, you're saying what the result you like want? It's like a the, play. Yeah, it's like it's like yes, a Brecht play, like which we were just talking no, about no, yesterday. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's in my head. <laughs> so we should end on a Brecht play. I think that's Perfect. where this, that's where this was all headed. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, just in closing, we gotta bend down here. Just you in want to closing. Say here you go. <laughs> Thanks, seat. Jonah. So just in closing, we will have the recording of this session, so you can pass it on to your friends. 
um, who might have missed the session today. We'll have that on YouTube and send it out to all of our registrants. And follow us at BuzzFeed U for upcoming events so we can stay in touch. Uh, and that's it. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thanks, Bye. Guys. Yes. Bye.